Um, quite a big subject. I'm not sure I'll get through all that I've uh, prepared for tonight, but we will be looking at the issues relating to the relationship, particularly between Messianic faith and Judaism, and the answer which we have in Yeshua the Messiah. Uh, partly I was um, kind of prompted by reading a book by a, a man called Asher Norman, who's a rabbi, uh, who wrote a book called 26 Reasons Why Jews Don't Believe in Jesus, which I thought was a bit provocative, so I thought I'd give one or two reasons why uh, Jewish people should believe in Jesus as Yeshua, as the Messiah. And uh, just to give a basis, let's look at something which, uh, in essence, we agree with on the issue of the Torah, that it is the Word of God, Um, though there are one or two areas where there are disagreements with Orthodox Judaism, and particularly with Liberal Judaism. Um, Just as an introduction, in the second epistle to Paul to Timothy, he wrote in chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Uh, So our New Testament teaches us that all scripture, and all scripture, of course, means all scripture from Genesis through to Revelation. Actually, Revelation wasn't written when Timothy wrote this, but uh, that's also scripture. But as far as uh, believers in the Messiah are concerned, we should believe that the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, The Tanakh, as it's called in Hebrew, is the inspired word of God. Uh, If you turn on to 2 Peter, chapter 1, which you'll find in this Bible on page 1080. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 19. Peter said, We have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that dawns in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. The prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Uh, So the Bible tells us in the New Testament that holy men of God in the times of the Old Testament were inspired, uh, carried along the word actually means by the Holy Spirit, and inspired to write the words which we have in our Bibles. If you just turn over to the next page in 2 Peter chapter 3, there's an interesting little passage which tells us that uh, in verse 3 it says, Knowing this, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the water, earth standing out of water and in water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. If you actually work out what that scripture is saying, it says that in the last days people are going to scoff uh, at issues relating to God, and there are three things particularly it says there. One is the second coming of Jesus, that Jesus is coming again. The second is that God created the heavens and the earth. And the third is that there was a literal flood in which the whole earth was inundated. Uh, So those three issues are going to be under attack uh, in the last days. And it's clear that that's not just in the world, it's also in the professing church. And even, as we shall see, in the synagogue. Um, Now, if that's the case, then you should expect that there will be an attack on the word of God, particularly on the passages which deal with the beginning and the end. Does that make sense? Because those are the passages which deal with it. So if there's an attack on the beginning, that would include Genesis uh, and all the books of the Torah, the five books of Moses, which we have in the first five books of the Bible, and also the book is the end, the Revelation, and the passages in the New Testament which speak about the literal second coming of the Messiah. Okay, with that in mind, let's look at what uh, we can learn about the Torah, the writing of the Torah. Understand, when I talk about the Torah, of course, I mean the five books of Moses, Uh, also known as the Pentateuch, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, As far as Judaism is concerned, uh, this is the basis of the Jewish faith. I put some quotations here from uh, Jewish sources, Orthodox Jewish sources. First one is from Maimonides. Uh, It says, This is that you believe that all of this Torah that was given by Moses, our teacher, peace be upon him, that is all from the mouth of God, meaning that it was received by him entirely from God. Maimonides, the principles of faith. Um, So 
the statement there that the Torah, the, word of, the five books of Moses were given by God to Moses, uh, all from the mouth of God. Uh, <coughs> the second uh, phrase, which is um, said by Orthodox Jews as the uh, Torah is raised to be returned to the Aran Kodesh, that's the Holy Ark, uh, after the uh, Torah service, is Vezot HaTorah. This is that Torah which Moses set before the people of Israel by the mouth of God through the hand of Moses. Uh, these phrases were merged from Deuteronomy 4 and Numbers chapter 9, verse 23. So this is that, this is the Torah, the one which Moses received. Obviously it's not the same parchment which he received, but it's the same message. The message has been passed down from generation to generation. And one of the remarkable things about the preservation of the word of God is the way in which the uh, Jewish people have looked after this word and passed it on from one generation to another and have written it down on scrolls. Um, the art of being ascribed to copy the word of God, to copy the, the Torah, is um, very highly regarded in Jewish uh, Judaism, it's one of the highest uh, things which you can aspire to, to copy the scriptures. And if you make one, one word different, then one, one word is different, then the whole Torah scroll has to be disregarded. It must be checked uh, by numerous ways to make sure that the words are exactly copied word for word uh, and passed on then from one generation to another. Um, this is a comment by a rabbi, an orthodox rabbi called Rabbi R.A. Kaplan, um, he says, the Torah is the foundation of Judaism. Without it, Judaism cannot exist. God revealed the Torah through Moses. It is thus written, Moses commanded us the Torah, an inheritance to the congregation of Jacob. It is the foundation of our faith that the entire Torah, both written and oral, was revealed to Moses by God. It's the foundation of our faith that every word of the Torah was dictated to Moses by God. A person who denies the divine origin of even a single word or variant spelling or reading in the Torah is considered a non-believer who has no portion in the world to come. Concerning such a person, it is written, because he has despised God's word, his soul shall be utterly cut off, his sin shall remain upon him. Um, so there's a very strong statement saying that if you disregard even one word or even one letter from the Torah, um, you are actually despising the word of God. Um, I have to say there are at least two things I disagree with the rabbi there on. Um, one is that the written and the oral Torah were revealed to Moses. Um, I'll say a bit more about that next time we look at this, but uh, according to Orthodox Judaism, when Moses received the written law, the Torah, he also received what's called the oral Torah, or the, uh, the law which was passed on by word of mouth, not written down, passed on from one generation to another, and eventually written down in the books which are today the, the Mishnah, the Talmud, and the, the books which are commentaries basically on the Torah, but not the actual word of God itself. And according to Orthodox Judaism, this is believed to be equally inspired as the word of God. So a bit more about that next time we look at it. But uh, as believers in the Messiah, we actually don't believe that. We believe that the written word is the word of God, but not the oral Torah. And I'll show also another time that, in fact, the scriptures give no evidence whatsoever that there was an oral Torah. In fact, they give evidence that there is not. Uh, but that is the belief of Orthodox Judaism. Um, <clears throat> I have here put a quotation from a liberal rabbi. Now, liberal Judaism uh, follows pretty much the same line as liberal Christianity in questioning the uh, authority of the word of God and the inspiration of the word of God. And Rabbi says here, we liberal Jews accept the findings of modern research, archaeological and literary, which indicates that the Torah was not written all at one time. It was written and edited over a very long time. Its oldest strands might be more than 4,000 4, years old. Its newest might be only 2,500 years old. That's a span of 1,500 years. It was the work of many authors, all of whom were inspired by a wish to express God's will and nevertheless embedded in their own times and cultures. Revelation by Rabbi Stephen Howard. Uh, and I have to say that I don't believe, and I'll be showing you why I don't believe that in a moment. Um, it's basically the view that Moses didn't write the, the Torah. It was written by editors uh, who put it together over a period of 900 years, and it was finished around about the time of Ezra uh, and the time when the Jewish people came back from Babylon uh, uh, after the uh, time in Babylon. Okay, we'll come back to that one because it affects Christianity as well. In fact, it originated more in the Christian sphere than in the Jewish sphere. But it's affected both liberal and Christianity and Judaism. Okay, there are different views, Jewish views, on how the Torah came to be written. Um, according to the rabbi, Rabbi Kaplan, who I've already quoted, 
Uh, basically, the entire Torah was written by Moses as dictated by God. So, really, he just was the scribe who wrote it down. God gave him the words, he wrote them down, um, more or less by kind of automatic writing, as you could say. God revealed it to him. Uh, these include all the happenings recorded in, from the time of creation. Just before the revelation at Sinai, wrote, Moses wrote everything that had transpired up to that point. It's thus written, Moses wrote all of God's words. Exodus 24, verse 4. Before completing the covenant, he read this part of the Torah. It is written, Moses took the book of the covenant and read it so that the people would hear. They said, all that God has spoken we will do and we will listen. Exodus 24, verse 7. After this, God would call Moses to the tent of meeting to discuss, dictate the Torah to him. God would call Moses and Moses would acknowledge that he was ready. God would dictate each passage of the Torah to Moses and Moses would repeat it aloud. He would then write it down. Uh, that's from writing the Torah again by Rabbi Kaplan. In other words, it was um, received by Moses in stages. First of all, the events of the book of Genesis and up to the uh, Mount Sinai then, what happened at Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments, and the part which Moses then reads in chapter 24 of Exodus, and then the later parts at a later date, uh, as Moses was going through the wilderness, and when he went into the tabernacle, as it says here. Uh, you have different views, and I'm looking through uh, different rabbis, what they've said about this. You'll find that's not uh, the view held by all rabbis. In fact, the Zohar, which is a book of Jewish mysticism, states that the Torah was created prior to the creation of the world. It was used as the blueprint for creation. Um, I went to a lecture at the Jewish Learning Exchange, which is in Golders Green Road, and the rabbi, Rabbi Tantz, was giving a lecture on this, and he said that uh, the Torah was actually written 2,000 years before the creation of the world, uh, and it was the blueprint which was used by God to create the heavens and the earth. Um, he did then raise a logical question, which uh, he didn't answer, which was, if it was created 2,000 years before the creation of the world... Uh, years are measured by the earth going around the sun, so how did you measure uh, years before anything was created? <laughs> Didn't give an answer to that one, but it was... But what is interesting, actually, is that we do believe that God created the heavens and the earth through the word of God, and the word of God is actually Yeshua. Uh, so there is an idea that there was some means by which God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, the Midrash assumes that during the 40 days and nights that Moses spent on Mount Sinai, God revealed the entire Bible well as the Mishnah and the Talmud, that's the Oral Torah, uh, and he received the whole lot, as it were, on Mount Sinai. So that again is slightly different from what Rabbi Kaplan was saying. Uh, <clears throat> another rabbi, Ramban, he says that when Moses came down from the mountain, he wrote from the beginning of the Torah till the end of the story of the tabernacle, the conclusion of the Torah he wrote at the end of the 40th year. Now you have a bit of a problem if Moses wrote the whole of the Torah, um, of Mount Sinai because there were events which weren't, were going to happen later, like the golden calf, the rebellion of Korah, the um, failure to go into the promised land at Kadesh Barnea, and the uh, 40 years of wandering. Uh, so that's another way in which he's dealing with that particular problem. Okay, another rabbi, Rabbi Solomon wrote in Spain, Moses did not write each passage at the time it was said to him, but rather he ordered them orally until the end of the Torah. But passages which were necessary at the time he would write down so that people could see them and learn from them a written text. So you've got another view there that he didn't write anything down. Uh, he just received it orally and he wrote it down at the end of the period of the wanderings through the wilderness uh, as he was writing Deuteronomy. So that's just to show you that there are different views within rabbinic Judaism, and this is all Orthodox Jews, about how Moses received and wrote the Torah. Though they all agree that Moses was the author. There's no question about that. Uh, Moses is the sole author of the Torah. Uh, liberal Judaism, as I've already quoted from this uh, writing from Rabbi Howard, accepts the view that the Torah was written over a long period of time by different authors. This means accepting the views of Spinoza, Graf, and Wellhausen, others who deny that Moses is the author of the Torah. Uh, views taught in German theological colleges in the 19th century, spreading to Christian and Jewish theological academies, but which are rejected by Orthodox Judaism and conservative Christianity. A little bit more about that because it's relevant to us as well as to Judaism. Um, if you don't believe that Moses wrote the Torah, then you actually begin to undermine the whole of the Bible. 
And if it was revealed over many years, then it's saying that uh, God is actually a liar, that the Bible doesn't, is not true. And I would say that one of the major reasons why there is so much unbelief in the church is because many people go to theological colleges where they're taught this kind of stuff. And because they go to such theological colleges, they end up with their faith being undermined. I remember one time I was uh, down at Speaker's Corner in uh, Hyde Park and we were preaching and a guy came up to me afterwards and he said, I've listened to everything you say and I want to tell you I don't believe a word of it. I said, okay, praise the Lord, (laughs) at least he listened. (laughs) But then he said why he didn't believe. He said, I used to believe it. Then I went to theological college and by the time I'd finished three years at theological college, I ended up disbelieving the word of God, which is tragic, isn't it? And sadly that happens to uh, people in this land, throughout Europe, Uh, and in America, and because of that, their faith is based upon, their faith is undermined. So if they then go out, this man lost his faith, though he never went in to be a pastor, but if people go out to be leaders of churches, and they still have uh, a mixture of the faith which they once had, and the the Bible being questioned, then it's going to undermine their ministry, isn't it? And their ability to believe the word of God. So this uh, view, which I'm just going to explain to you now, uh, which is very widely taught in theological colleges, one has to say, uh, is a major stumbling block, and I would say a cause of unbelief in the church. If you think also that it originated mainly in Germany in the 19th century and permeated through the German churches in the 19th century, what happened to Germany in the 20th century? Uh, What happened when that faith in God and Jesus was uh, largely undermined, that you don't have a vacuum and another spirit has to come in? And... The demonic spirit of Nazism actually came in to a country which had been had its Christian faith. Maybe it was not all born again Christians, but the basis of faith in the Bible had been undermined uh, in the churches as well as in the land. Okay, so what is the uh, this is the what's called the documentary hypothesis, the critical view of the Torah. I hope you can follow me because I'll try and make it simple. Um, please note this is not what I believe, but this is what is taught. And I'll show you why it can't be true. Um, Jewish philosopher called Ber- uh, Spinoza, uh, in the 17th century, he wrote, it's clearer than the sun at noonday that Moses did not author the Pentateuch. Uh, he was a rationalist. He was actually not uh, accepted by the synagogue. And because of that, he uh, became a very well-known philosopher. But he was, in some ways, the father of the critical movement towards the Bible. And as I put here, all liberal Bible colleges and seminaries, sadly some which profess conservative evangelical doctrine, today teach the documentary hypothesis known as the JEDP hypothesis. Okay, um, That includes some colleges which people go to, even London Bible Colleges teaches something along these lines. So you can find that there are Bible colleges which teach uh, things which are actually undermining the faith in the, in the revealed word of God. The critical view denies that Moses wrote Genesis to Deuteronomy, teaches that various anonymous authors compiled these five books, plus other portions of the Old Testament from centuries of oral tradition up to 900 years after Moses lived, uh, if he even existed, some would say. The narrators are designated as follows. The first one is J. Uh, J stands for Yahweh, or Jehovah, and they, according to this idea, the uh, writers of the J strand of Genesis lived about 900 to 850 BC. They gathered the myths and legends of Babylon and other nations and added to them the stories of the Hebrews, producing those Bible passages where the Hebrew letters yod heh vav uh, Jehovah, are used as the name of God. If you look in the Old Testament, you'll find that uh, where our Bible translates Lord, uh, God as Lord, with a capital letter L-O-R-D, that's where in Hebrew it says yod heh vav heh which is the name Yahweh or Jehovah. Uh, there's actually only one point I would ever agree with Jehovah's Witnesses, which is they say that it's wrong to translate the word Yahweh as Lord in the, in the Old Testament. They actually do have a point, because yod heh vav heh is a name, it's not a title Lord. And... Uh, it's not Jehovah because it is highly unlikely that the name will be pronounced that way in Hebrew, but it could be Yahweh. We don't actually know how it's pronounced because uh, Orthodox Jewish people won't pronounce that name because it's too holy. So when they find the name Yahweh or Jehovah in the text, they say Adonai, meaning the Lord. But in the actual word, it is not. it doesn't mean Lord, it's a name. 
uh, Yahweh or Jehovah, which means I am who I am, the eternal self-existent one. Okay, then you have E, which is Elohist or Elohim, the other word used for God, particularly in the first chapter of the Genesis, where it says, in the beginning, Elohim, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, This is supposedly uh, coming from the northern kingdom of Israel from 750 to 700 BC. And they wrote these passages where Elohim is used for uh, the name of God. And according to the idea I'm giving you, the Bible was sort of cobbled together by uh, different verses. And in some cases, it's not just different uh, chapters, but even different verses which uh, come from the two sources. So you have the two sources being put together as one, one, one text, which has never happened to any other book in history and didn't happen to the Bible either. Um, just to give you some indication, the, the word for, in the first chapter of Genesis, it uses the word Elohim for God. In the second chapter, it does bring in the word Yahweh or Jehovah. Uh, now, I don't have any problem with that being the same author, and I'll show you why it is written by the same author, but the, the, the theory which I'm giving you tells you that it was written by different authors. The third one is D, which is supposed to be Deuteronomy. And according to this theory, Deuteronomy was written in 621 BC at the time of Josiah in the incident which you read about in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 8. Just turn to that, 2 Kings 22, verse 8. <clears throat> this, is, this is on page 353 if you have this Bible. It says, Then Hilkiah the priest said to Shaphan the tri- scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. Um, then Shaphan reads the book before the king. It says in verse 10, verse 11, Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest uh, and others saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people and for all Judah, Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. Uh, now this is a very dramatic passage of scripture. It tells about how Josiah, uh, how the word of God was found in the temple. According to the documentary hypothesis, it wasn't just found there, it was written. So they wrote this book and they found it and they gave it to Josiah and Josiah then uh, had this time of repentance. Um, now that doesn't make any sense because in fact uh, the book which they say was found was the book of Deuteronomy. Now it's quite possible actually that the book which was read to Josiah was Deuteronomy because if he'd read Deuteronomy, that would have been the effect which it would have, been, have upon him. Especially when Deuteronomy, at the end of it, has in chapter 28, uh, the blessings and the curses which are going to come upon Israel if they're obedient or disobedient. And reading Deuteronomy and coming to the end of Deuteronomy, he could see, well, Israel's been disobedient to the Lord, uh, therefore judgment will come upon us, which was actually the case, because not long after Josiah, the Babylonians were going to come and to take Judah into captivity. But that doesn't mean that the book was written then. That's making a leap of uh, faith or understanding, which is not there in the scriptures. The evidence is that it was written long before. The reason why it wasn't read was because they'd just been through a time of tremendous apostasy and falling away from the Lord, which you read about in the days of King Manasseh. So the Bible had become set on one side, and instead of being read, it had been neglected. When they found it again, they were actually stunned by what they found. And you could say that in many parts of the world today, the Bible is very little known. And when people read it, they may be uh, actually amazed to find what it says. And if you're living in our time, you might be amazed to find out that we're living in the last days and that Jesus is coming back again and you need to repent, uh, which was actually the message which Josiah got from this, that we're living in days when judgment's about to fall, and therefore we need to repent and put things right and put away that judgment. Okay, so that's the hypothesis. Uh, the, third, the fourth one is that P represents the priests who lived during the exile in Babylon and allegedly composed a code for holiness for the people, uh, writing Leviticus, etc., in the days of Ezra the scribe. And various re- editors are supposedly put all this together. That is the JEDP hypothesis. Now, if you're a bit bemused by that, don't believe it, because that's what I'm just telling you is taught in many Bible colleges today. Um, and <clears throat> it's put forward, first of all, by a Frenchman called Jean Astruc in Paris in 1753. Foremost exponent was 
Julius Wellhausen, who was a German who restated this and taught it in theological colleges. Now, as I said, this ties in very much with what the Bible says, that they're going to be scoffers in the last days. Um, and it ties in with the idea that people reject the authority of the word of God. Now, in this church, we actually believe that the, the Bible is the word of God, from Genesis through to Revelation. Therefore, we don't believe that. So uh, just get in your heads that I'm not telling you something which is true. I'm telling you something which is untrue, but which is believed by many people today because of the teaching which is taught in uh, theological colleges. Now, today we find that in the world there is a rejection, as I said, of the beginning and the end, of Genesis and Revelation. If you reject Genesis uh, as the account of how we came to be here, there are two reasons why people are going to do this. One is because of Darwinism, because they say that uh, we came here by evolution over millions of years, and Genesis says that the world is uh, much younger than that. Uh, so we don't believe Genesis for that apart reason. The other is because of what I've just told you, being taught in Bible colleges. Uh, if this view is correct, then one has to say that the Torah is a pious fraud. Because the Torah itself says that it was written by Moses. It also says that it was written in the generation that came out of Egypt. Especially the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, more than any other, is Moses' last words to the people of Israel as they came out of the wilderness uh, through the wilderness and we're about to go into the promised land and over and over again in Deuteronomy it's written that this is for that generation uh, these were the words of Moses to that generation and in Deuteronomy also it has the restatement of the Ten Commandments uh, which you have in Exodus as well Ten Commandments say you shall not bear false witness uh, so if the Torah was written seven or nine hundred years later it's bearing false witness isn't it therefore you don't pay attention to it if it was written at that time that it says it was, then you do pay attention to it. So it does make a difference to how you see the Bible, what you believe about it. Now, I believe the evidence is there that Moses wrote the Torah. It was written in that generation, and it was passed down from one generation to another. Uh, the Bible itself says this. Uh, the Bible, the Torah claims that Moses was the author. If you look in Exodus chapter 24, we already referred to that, but in Exodus 24 verse... Four, that's on page 72. <clears throat> Exodus 24, verse 4, page 72. Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings and oxen to the Lord. Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Uh, so it's clear that Moses wrote something. It was a book there which he read from, and it was the words which God had given to him on Mount Sinai, uh, the Ten Commandments, and also, most likely, the, verse, the chapters which follow the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus. Turn on to chapter 34 of Exodus, verse 27. Exodus 24, verse 37. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write these words, for according to the tenor of these words, I made a covenant with you and with Israel. Uh, so that's the second time that Moses is up on the mountain and God tells him to write down the words. If you turn to chapter 33 of Numbers, that's two books further on, page 154 in this Bible. Numbers 33, these are the journeys of the children of Israel who went out from the land of Egypt by their armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron. Now Moses wrote down the starting points of their journeys at the command of the Lord. Uh, so Numbers is actually a count of the journeys of Israel and the events which took place during that time. But it says again that Moses wrote down these things. Uh, so there was a written record which Moses had of the events which had taken place. Uh, other parts of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, confirm the authorship of the Torah, the law of Moses. 
Uh, Joshua in particular, verse chapter 8 of Joshua, page 201 in this Bible. Joshua 8, verse 34. Afterward, Joshua read all the words of the law, the blessings and the cursings, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel, with the women, the little ones, and the strangers who were living among them. So here it says that Joshua read something which was written. Moses had written it. It was transferred to Joshua, the one who followed after Moses. And Joshua read the words of Moses. In fact, he read all the words of Moses. That's an interesting scripture because it doesn't say anything about any oral traditions, just as he read the words which were written down. Uh, And he read all the words which Moses had given him. Let's turn on to 2 Kings, chapter 14. That's on page 343. 2 Kings 14, verse 6. This is an interesting scripture because uh, if you remember I said to you that the Wellhausen idea is that Deuteronomy was written at the time of King Josiah. Now this is before King Josiah and it quotes from the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, So this is in the days of King Amaziah. It says, The children of the murderers he did not execute according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, in which the Lord commanded, Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor children be put to death for their fathers, for a person shall be put to death for his own sin. That's a quote from Deuteronomy. It's written long before Josiah. Okay? And we'll read just one more from this list. You can look up the others if you want to. Take your sheets home with you. Nehemiah chapter 8, page 435. Nehemiah chapter 8. This is in the time after the return of the Jews from Babylon. Uh, when Ezra is teaching them. Now, according to the Wellhausen hypothesis, Ezra was one of the authors of the last part of the Torah. Ezra doesn't say anything about that himself, but it says here, all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women, and all who could hear with understanding the first day of the seventh month, and he read from it in the open square. And it says, goes on to say how he read to them from the book of the law. So Moses read, uh, sorry, Ezra read the book of the law given by Moses, not the books which he'd written up himself. Notice that. Turn to the New Testament, and Jesus affirms continually the authorship of the Torah by Moses. End of Luke chapter 24. Verse 44, page 937, if you have this Bible. Luke 24, verse 44, Then Jesus said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Uh, So Jesus affirms the law as being written by Moses. Turn over the page. John 1, verse 17 The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Turn to chapter 5 of John, verse 46, page 943. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. If you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Uh, So Jesus and the writers of the Old Testament all affirm that the words of the Torah are Moses' words. Uh, So if you deny that Moses is the author of the Torah, you actually undermine the Bible. So how can we believe that Moses wrote the Torah? Obviously, there is a bit of an issue. Uh, The issue is that Genesis to Deuteronomy deals with a very long period of time. If you believe uh, the dates of the Bible, we can't be sure about the date of creation. Archbishop Usher put it as 4004 BC. Uh, The Jewish date is around 3761 BC. Uh, The flood, around 2,304 BC, the Exodus, 1491 BC, and the death of Moses, 1451 BC. So all those dates are approximate, but as you can see, there's a long period of time uh, 
separating the beginning from the end of the writings of the Torah. So how could Moses have written about all those thousands, long period of time? How could he have known the information? How could he be the author of a book chronicling events over such a long period of time? Uh, some people would say that the pre-flood events are mythological, and even the supernatural events of Exodus are mythological. Uh, again, I don't believe that because I believe that God is who he says he is. He says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So if God created the heavens and the earth, he can then intervene in the events of the heavens and the earth as well. In other words, he can do miracles. He can do supernatural things. So if you believe that God is who he says he is, you shouldn't have a problem with interventions of God taking place on the earth. In other words, miracles. If you don't believe that God is who he says he is, then you may have a problem with that. But it really comes down to believing that God is who he says he is. He's the creator. Therefore, he can intervene with what happens on the earth. Uh, So he can intervene by sending Jesus to the world and uh, Jesus dying on the cross and rising from the dead. He can also intervene, as he's going to do in the not-too-distant future, with the events of the second coming. The rapture of the church, the time of the tribulation, and the second coming of Christ to the earth are all going to be amazing supernatural events, which will be interventions of God in the affairs of this planet. Uh, So it does come down to our belief in whether God is able to do that. Now, I believe he is, so I don't have a problem with the supernatural events of the Bible. Um, <clears throat> if you take the view which is that there really was a Genesis flood, a worldwide flood, which affected the, uh, the earth, affected even the climate of the earth, and the creatures of the earth, then you can harmonize uh, the world which we now have with Genesis. If you take the evolutionary view, then you have a problem. But if you believe that the Bible is true, that Genesis describes what happened, then what happened was that there was a world which existed before the flood, which was destroyed by the flood. During that time, all of the fossils were deposited, and uh, the climate actually changed, so you had changing conditions on the earth, which uh, caused life to be shortened. explains a whole lot of things which are uh, different about the pre-flood world to the world we have today. The issue is, though, how did we get information about the pre-flood world? Uh, which is, again, relevant to how was the Torah written. So let's look at the th- views about how Moses wrote the Torah. hope you've followed me so far. You're left with three possibilities. One is what Rabbi Kaplan actually said, that God, re- God just dictated the words to Moses. So Moses was like a scribe who just wrote it all down. Um, he didn't really have any influence over what was written. It was all... God. Now, in a sense, it's true that God did inspire Moses. The whole thing is inspired by God. As we shall see, there's evidence also of the supernatural design of the Torah. Uh, remarkable evidence is actually about even the letters, how they're written, uh, which show the supernatural influence of God. Uh, on the other hand, Moses was also a real human being, and the idea of inspiration in the scripture is that God chose men, ordinary men, and inspired to them the word of God. So supernaturally, the word of God came upon them, and the Holy Spirit came upon them and revealed to them the truths of the word of God. They were carried along, if you like, by the Spirit to write the words which God revealed to them. Now, there are parts of the Torah which actually were written directly by God. Uh, There's one part particularly which we know was written directly by God. What's that? Ten Commandments. It says that God wrote them with his finger of God on the stone. So the Ten Commandments actually were written directly by God. But the rest of it was inspired by God, and uh, Moses wrote down what God told him to write. Number two, I told you I don't believe that it was mythological material cobbled together by other sources at a later date. The third one is what I do believe, is that Moses was the editor of material which was already made available to him by those who'd lived earlier. All were inspired by the Lord, and the material was preserved by the supernatural intervention of God. Moses was inspired as he brought this material together. So we come to the question about Genesis. How did Moses know about things which happened before the flood? Uh, If you look in Genesis, um, and we have been doing a study of Genesis in the mornings, that um, (coughs) there are certain things which come out of a study of the book. Obviously I'm pressed for time, so I can't go into this in huge detail. But if you look at Genesis, you find that there are sections in the book of Genesis. 
Interesting, there's a phrase which recurs several times in the book of Genesis. It's, these are the generations, or this, these, this is the history. Hebrew, Elei Toldot. First one you'll find in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. In this translation it says, this is the history of the heavens of the earth. In Hebrew it is, Elei Toldot. Elei Toldot Hashemayim the Haaretz. And uh, you'll find that the same phrase is found in Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. It says, Ele toldot Adam. These are the generations of Adam. Same phrase is used in Genesis 6, verse 9, Genesis 10, verse 1, and <coughs> Genesis 10, 27. Now, one of the views which... Uh, commends itself to me is that these are actually the rock records given by the pre-flood patriarchs which were then passed on and even were most likely written down. Uh, the first one, these are the generations of the, his, the heavens and the earth in the day when they were created. Uh, who was a witness of the creation of the heavens and the earth? Which human was a witness of them? trick question, nobody was, Adam wasn't (laughs) he didn't see it Uh, so how did he get information about the creation of the heavens and the earth well it says actually in the book in Genesis chapter 3 that the Lord walked and talked with Adam in the garden so before the fall God could have revealed these things to Adam and Adam could have written them down so you have the first section of the book of Genesis which ends with chapter 2 verse 4 and according to the teaching which I've been Looking at on this subject, the phrase, these are the generations, is not the beginning, it's the end of the section. So it ends the section, it completes it, so what uh, it speaks about is what's come before it. So the first section of the Bible is actually ends with Genesis 2 verse 4, which is what God actually revealed to Adam. Genesis 5 verse 1 is what Adam himself wrote, uh, because it does go up to the time of Adam. It ends with the seventh generation of Cain, which is about the time that Adam died. Uh, Genesis 5 actually speaks about people who lived after Adam, uh, so it would be information he wouldn't have had, but would have been available to Noah, who's the most likely source of that information. Genesis 5 has the genealogies of the patriarchs before the flood, Adam through to Noah. (coughs) And uh, that section could not have been written by Adam because it uh, speaks about Noah and his dates, so that was after Adam had died. Uh, And... Most likely that was written by Noah because it says in chapter 6, verse 9, this is the generation, same phrase, Ele Toldot, this is the genealogy of Noah. Uh, so it completes that section looking back. Um, I had mentioned when we uh, did this in the morning that another interesting fact is that the names given in Genesis chapter 5 of the patriarchs uh, actually mean something. Uh, Adam, Seth, Canaan, uh, no, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, uh, Mahalalel, Jared, uh, Enoch, Methuselah, Noah, uh, Lamech, and Noah. All those words mean something in English. Uh, they mean Adam, man, Seth, appointed, uh, Enosh, mortal, Canaan, sorrow. Mahalalel, God who is to be praised, Yared shall come down, <coughs> Enoch teaching, Methuselah his death shall bring, Lamech weary, Noah rest. Man is appointed to mortal sorrow, but the God who is to be praised shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the weary rest. Put that together and you have in Genesis 5 a statement of the gospel. Another remarkable indication of the supernatural origin of the scriptures. And also that they point to Yeshua, Jesus, as the Messiah. Okay, so this information could have been put down on either on clay tablets or passed down orally. I prefer to think it was actually written down on clay tablets and passed down from one generation to another. Obviously, this information would be of great value, so those who went into the ark would have preserved it, and they would have been believers, Noah and his sons, uh, and when they came out of the ark, they'd have taken it out of the ark. 
One of the interesting things you find is that one of Noah's sons, Shem, lived a long time after the flood. In fact, if you look on our little uh, genealogy of Jesus there, you can work out the dates of how long people lived, and you can work out that Shem lived at least until the time of Abraham. In fact, if you read the Talmud, there is a story in the Talmud which says that Abraham knew Shem. Uh, so that's not in the Bible, but it's in the Talmud. If that's the case, then Shem could have passed on the information uh, to Abraham, who passed it on to Isaac, to Jacob, and then it was taken down to Egypt, passed on to Joseph, kept in Egypt, and Moses was educated after the period of the, the slavery in Egypt in the house of Pharaoh. Uh, so Moses could have access to that information and then written it down in the Torah. Now, I can't prove that, but it's an interesting possibility. Certainly, if that information was there, it would have been treated as something of tremendous value. And it may also explain why it was so important that the succession of sons from one patriarch to another was the right one, so that he would treat that information with uh, respect and pass it on, so that it could eventually be written down in the Bible which we have. <clears throat> so that would explain how Moses could get hold of the information to write in Genesis. Rabbi Kaplan says he just got the whole lot from God, which is in a way simpler, but I believe that it makes more sense to say that God actually preserved this information and passed it on from generation to generation. I've given you here the Hebrew names for these books, by the way, Exodus, Shemot, Leviticus, Vayikra. Uh, Moses was there to receive the, see the events in Egypt, also to receive the commandments from God. And the later part of Exodus, which is the tabernacle and the priesthood and the sacrifices in Leviticus. Numbers is the account of the journey through the wilderness. And we're told in Numbers 33 that God did tell Moses to write down the uh, events as they, and the journeyings of Israel. And Deuteronomy itself tells us that it sums up the words of Moses following the time in the wilderness, the 40 years of wandering, it is the second statement of the law. That's what it means, deuteronomos. In Greek, it's the second law. Hebrew name is devarim, words that means. And it was given by Moses to the Israelites uh, and passed on to Joshua. There is a question in Judaism about who wrote the last chapter of Deuteronomy because it says that that's about the death of Moses. Did Moses write about his own death? Uh, one rabbi actually says he did write about it. He wrote about it with tears. Others say that it was written by Joshua uh, to complete the book of, of Deuteronomy, uh, which probably makes more sense, actually, that Joshua could have written the last part of Deuteronomy uh, as he wrote the book of Joshua himself. But with all this, I believe that Moses was the author of the Torah, that he was a master craftsman who weaved the whole uh, book together in the remarkable book which we have today, which is itself a supernatural book inspired by God. Um, there are some interesting evidences about the supernatural origin of the Torah. Uh, for one thing, the uh, Israelis actually put the words of the Torah through a computer and uh, in the Haifa University at Technion, and they came up with the 80% probability that it was written by one author. Um, another more interesting one is... Uh, I have one copy of it here. It's uh, The Miracle of Septenary Design in the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, this was discovered by a Russian mathematician called Dr. Ivan Panin, who was an agnostic but a Hebrew expert. And he decided to do some checks on the, on the Torah, the words of the Torah. And he discovered right the way through the Torah, especially in the early chapters of Genesis, especially in the first chapter of Genesis, uh, an amazing pattern of sevens. Uh, patterns of sevens which were repeated right the way through. Um, it's a little bit complicated to explain, and as my time's going on, I won't try to do that. But if you want to look this up, if you type in septenary design on the, on the Google, you get this, this pamphlet, or you can have a look at it here. But it's amazing just how these patterns of seven were found in the scriptures. Uh, he then tried to, A, replicate it himself, and found it was totally impossible. He couldn't do it. Um, he tried to find if there are any other books which had the same design, none except the New Testament in Greek. So work that one out. <laughs> Another evidence for the supernatural origin is the 
types of the Messiah and the sac- salvation and the sacrifice of Messiah which we have in the, in the text itself. Again, I haven't time to go into all of these, but if you want to just look into them, these are just the major types of Messiah you'll find in the Torah in the five books of Moses. First of all, that promises that there will be the seed of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent, uh, fulfilled in Yeshua, the Messiah, who was born of a woman, born of a virgin, and who by his death crushed the head of the serpent, delivered us from the power of Satan, from the power of evil, and gave eternal life to all those who believe in his name. Uh, in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve were clothed, with, clothed themselves with fig leaves, but God then clothed them with animal skins. Clothing them with animal skins meant that there had to be a death of the animal, so that they tried to cover their nakedness, as it were, with their own good works, but God actually covered them with the animal skins, which represent the death of the animal, that something had to die in order to cover their sin. It speaks to us about Yeshua, the Messiah, who died to cover us from our sin. The story of Noah tells us that there was a judgment coming on the earth, and there was only one way you could be saved from that judgment that was going into the ark, one place of salvation. And that ark was designed supernaturally. Uh, interestingly, when uh, modern uh, boat builders looked at the dimensions of the ark, they said that this was uh, the dimensions of the ark were perfect if you wanted to build a boat that didn't have to go anywhere, but also had to stay upright in very turbulent conditions. And that was exactly what the ark had to do. It was also covered with pitch, which uh, in Hebrew uh, has the same root as the word kippah, uh, which is to the atonement or to cover. So the, the ark itself was covered with uh, the pitch, which was the atonement. atonement. Uh, there was only one way into the ark, and uh, if you didn't go in through that way, you were going to drown with the rest of humanity and all the creatures of the earth, apart from the animals which went into the ark. One way of salvation speak to us about Yeshua as the one way to be saved. Genesis 14 tells us about a man called Melchizedek who met with Abraham and gave him bread and wine, who origins were unknown. And in the psalm, it says that he, uh, we have a priest of the order of Melchizedek, uh, that he would be one who'd be of ancient origins, speaks of Yeshua as the one who comes from eternity, giving us bread and wine as the means by which we can receive uh, fellowship with him, speaking of his death and his sacrifice. Isaac, the only son of Abraham, to be sacrificed, God intervened to save him. And Hebrews tells us that the, uh, Isaac was like one who has been raised from the dead. Yeshua, the only son who was sacrificed for our sins and rose from the dead. Joseph is a type of Messiah's suffering and exaltation. He went down into Egypt. Uh, he was exalted. And he, even in the rabbis, they call the Messiah the suffering Messiah of Isaiah 53, Mashiach ben Yosef, Messiah the son of Joseph. The Passover lamb was the sacrifice which saved Israel from the angel of death. The blood of the lamb was put on the doorposts of their houses and then the angel of death passed over from death to life. Speaks to us about Yeshua, sacrificed at the time of the Passover, who through whose death we can have eternal life. Uh, The design of the tabernacle points to the Messiah. I won't go into that because it's a long subject in itself. The animal sacrifices for sin uh, point to Yeshua as the sacrifice who died for our sins in order to redeem us. In the book of Numbers, you read about how the Israelites were told to lift up a snake in the wilderness when they'd been bitten by the snakes. When they looked to that snake, they were healed from the plague. Uh, Jesus himself refers to that in John chapter 3, saying that the Son of Man will be lifted up as we look to him. We are saved from the power of sin. And Yeshua is the prophet like unto Moses. He appeared as the angel of the Lord in many passages in the book of Genesis. Well, all of those are actually subjects on their own. I could give you a sermon on each of those. But they tell you that there is, in the Hebrew scriptures, there are pointers which show us that Yeshua is the Messiah and that he is the one who was there at the beginning and through whom the world was made and who revealed all these things to Moses for our benefit. According to the New Testament, the Torah, the law of Moses, is a tutor to bring us to to Messiah. It actually reveals to us that we sin, that we break God's commandments. And as we read the commandments of God, the Ten Commandments, each one of us has to recognize that we do sin against God. 
but none of us can say that we are wholly righteous. Therefore, we need the mediation of the Messiah to redeem us. And the Holy Spirit gives us revelation of the meaning of the Torah when we turn to the Messiah. Read 2 Corinthians, it shows you that, that when we turn to Messiah, then the veil is taken away and we can see the truth of the Word of God and to apply it correctly to our lives. And the book of Hebrews, again, you could spend a lot of time looking at this, how the tabernacle, the priesthood and the sacrifices all are types of the Messiah and all fulfilled in Yeshua, who has come in order to redeem us. Okay, well, that's a very brief sort of rush through the Torah, but I hope it gives you some uh, thoughts to think about and you can take these uh, notes away and read the, uh, look up the references and to believe that the word of God which we have is the inspired word of God. It is the truth. It's the one which... Uh, is unique. There's no other book like this book inspired by God. And there are so many evidences within it which point to the fact that it is the truth. And it points to Yeshua, who is the one of whom Moses and the prophet spoke, who is the way, the truth, and the life. The one through whom we, whether we're Jewish or Gentile, can have access to God and have our sins forgiven and eternal life. Amen. Okay, I'll close there. Uh, If anyone does want to ask me any questions, perhaps anyone got any questions briefly?